Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to talk about possibilism. According to possibilism, anything is possible. There are no necessary truths, period. Uh, possibilism is a fairly unpopular position, but it has been defended by Chris Mortensen and Robert Nozick, uh, so let's uh, take a look at it. Uh, now the first thing to say about this is that when we're talking about possibility here, we mean possibility in the broadest sense of the term. So there are many contexts in which we talk about what is possible or what is necessary, but where we intend to refer to some restricted domain. So I might say, for instance, that it is impossible for any object to accelerate beyond the speed of light. Now when I say this, I'm taking for granted that the physical laws are as they actually are, uh, but perhaps the physical laws could have been different. So perhaps it's possible, speaking unrestrictedly, that things do accelerate beyond the speed of light. Indeed, if we endorse multiverse theory, we might expect that there are literally other universes in which the laws of physics are different, and so objects in those universes do accelerate beyond the speed of light. So when I say that it is impossible to accelerate beyond the speed of light, I'm not talking about possibility in the broadest sense of the term. Um, what is physically possible, what is possible given the physical laws, is a, a subset of what is absolutely possible. Uh, this kind of absolute possibility uh, is sometimes also called metaphysical possibility. Um, so metaphysical possibility is the, the broadest kind of possibility, at least as we're going to use the phrase here. Um, so corresponding to this is metaphysical necessity, where for P to be metaphysically necessary is for P to be true in all worlds, in all situations, uh, then metaphysical impossibility is where P uh, is false in all worlds or all situations. One way to think about this is that if P is metaphysically impossible, then even God could not have brought it about that P. So presumably, if there is a God, God could have made it so that objects were able to accelerate beyond the speed of light. God could have brought about a world with different physical laws. Um, maybe God could have brought about, you know, a Newtonian world or an Aristotelian world or really, you know, all sorts of other kinds of worlds where objects can go beyond the speed of light. By contrast, it's often thought, not even God could have made a square circle. Uh, even God couldn't have brought that about. No matter how God makes the laws of the world, square circles are just ruled out. Square circles are impossible in the broadest sense of the term. <clears throat> so our question is, how broad is absolute possibility? Well, according to possibilism, it's maximally broad. Absolutely nothing is ruled out. So there's, there's sort of three views, right, that we can take here. Uh, possibilism says that anything is possible. So for any proposition, it might have been true. Nothing is impossible, uh, provided we're talking, of course, about the broadest sense of possibility. In the broadest sense of possibility, the world could have been any way at all. Then there is anti-possibilism, which simply says that there is at least one necessary truth. There's at least one truth that could not have been otherwise. Um, Mortensen, actually, in his articles on possibilism, calls anti-possibilism necessitarianism. But the thing is that uh, in the broader literature, necessitarianism is used for a different view. Necessitarianism is often used for the view that every proposition is either necessarily true or necessarily false. Nothing is contingent. Whatever way the world is, that is the way it must have been. So uh, the vast majority of philosophers endorse anti-possibilism. There are a few philosophers who have defended necessitarianism, um, most famously Spinoza. Uh, it has also been argued that the principle of sufficient reason entails necessitarianism. I will link a video about the principle of sufficient reason in the comments. Um, there's very few philosophers who have defended possibilism. Uh, so why should we take possibilism seriously? Well, here is one argument, uh, which we can call the explanation argument. Suppose that some proposition P is a necessary truth in the broadest sense, right? So what we're saying then is that not P is impossible. Not P is absolutely ruled out. It's not enough to say that it's ruled out relative to something else. It's not enough to say that not P is uh, 
ruled out by the physical laws or anything like that, that doesn't give us what we want because, you know, we can suppose that the physical laws might have been different. Uh, we're going to say, so the, the claim is that not P just can't hold no matter what. And the question is, well, why? What exactly is it about the world that could do this? What is it about the world that has the power, as it were, to r absolutely rule anything out? So, so if we ask this question, right, why can't not P hold? Well, this is going to involve giving some explanation of why it is that P is the case. So, for instance, if we ask, why is it that nothing can accelerate beyond the speed of light? Well, here we're going to give an explanation that will appeal to general relativity. Um, so, in answering the question, why is it that not P can't hold, we appeal to some Q, such that Q obtains, and Q entails P. But notice, um, so, so for instance, right, like, we, we, what we want to say in the case of the fact that nothing can accelerate beyond the speed of light is, well, you know, the reason why nothing can accelerate beyond the speed of light is because general relativity is true, and general relativity entails that nothing can accelerate beyond the speed of light. Um, so, you know, what we have is we're appealing to, you know, something else, <laughs> right, which is ruling this out. Uh, so, um, for any, in general, right, why can't not P hold we appeal to some Q such that Q is true and Q entails P. But of course, that just pushes the question of absolute impossibility one step back. After all, if we say that Q is merely a contingent truth, so we say that, you know, maybe not Q could have held, then we haven't actually explained the necessity of P. We haven't explained what rules out not P. Um, because obviously, if, if what is ruling out not P is Q, but then we're saying that not Q could have held, well, that hasn't ruled out not P. Um, so now we face the question, well, why, why is it that not Q can't hold? Um, and we now need to cite something else, R, such that R obtains and R entails Q. Now, obviously, what we have here um, is a kind of structure of dependence relations, and it's clear that there's only three options for what this structure might look like. So first of all, it might be that these dependence relations bottom out in some set of brute facts. So we'd be saying something like this, you know, why can't not P be true? Because Q must be true and Q entails P. Okay, why can't not Q be true? Because R must be true and R entails Q. Okay, but why can't not R be true? Ah, well, there's just no answer, right? It's just a brute fact that R must be true. R must be true, and that's that. And there's no further explanation. Um, so it's, it's just ruled out that not R, and that's just a brute fact. So that's one option. The second option is that these dependence relations have a circular structure. So it may be that, you know, we have a situation where like P depends on Q, Q depends on R, R depends on blah, 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 and so on. And, but then that kind of goes back to P. So we just have this kind of circularity. Um, and third, there may be an infinite regress of dependence relations, right? P depends on Q, Q depends on R, and so on, just indefinitely. We never circle back to P, but the sequence never ends. So it looks like these are the three options. Now, in fact, however, <clears throat> Maybe it isn't, maybe there aren't quite so many options, right? We might say, well, mm, maybe neither circularity nor infinite regress are actually an option here. So let's say that there is an infinite sequence of dependence relations. The problem is that we can then consider that entire sequence, and we can ask of that entire sequence why it must obtain. So, like, we have this sequence where we're saying, well, P must obtain because Q. Q must obtain because R, R must obtain because blah, 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 etc., and, and so on forever. But then, you know, we can think of this entire sequence, call it S. Right? Well, then why shouldn't there be some alternative infinite sequence, S star? Right? Like, what rules that out? What rules out having some alternative infinite sequence? Um, and if nothing rules out the alternative infinite sequence, then actually nothing rules out not P. Um, and so, obviously the same problem is going to arise for a circular sequence. 
And so if this is right, then it looks like, in the end, the necessities have to just bottom out in brute facts, right? So if there are necessary truths, then there must be some necessary truths that are just brute facts. Uh, certain things just must be the case, period, but where there is nothing that makes it so that the world must be that way rather than another way. But isn't that rather strange? Uh, so P is a metaphysical necessity, so not P is absolutely ruled out. And we've asked, you know, what is it about the world that could do this? What is it about the world that has the power to absolutely rule anything out? And the answer is nothing. Uh, so not P is completely ruled out, but it's not ruled out by anything. Um, but this seems, uh, well, it just seems rather odd, doesn't it? I suppose this is perhaps uh, a, um, uh, maybe a version of something like the... Um, you know, the queerness argument, similar to what we find in, uh, in meta-ethics. Um, the, if you believe that there are necessary truths, then if this argument is right, you're going to be committed to these uh, just kind of brute necessities. Um, and that's something that, um, are, well, perhaps people don't want to be committed to. Um, it's certainly perhaps odd to think about what these brute necessities, well, like what, I mean, again, you know, the, the, the initial question when we face this is, well, why is that the case, right? We, we want to give an explanation, but there just is no explanation to be had because it's just a brute fact. Um, so they just kind of, you know, these are sort of necessities that just, you know, float without foundation. Um, so anyway, that's one type of argument that might uh, sort of push somebody in a possibilist direction. Here's another argument. It's not quite a direct argument for possibilism, but it will perhaps undermine the force of anti-possibilist intuitions. It's a kind of pessimistic induction. So there's a long track record of philosophers claiming that certain propositions are metaphysically necessary, and then it turns out that these propositions are either merely contingently true or even outright false. Um, so Nozick gives this argument in his book Invariances. Um, so in the past, there were many grand claims about the world that were taken to be metaphysically necessary. For instance, the claim that every event has a cause, um, or the claim that space is Euclidean, so, you know, two parallel lines extended indefinitely can never meet, um, or the claim that nothing can be wholly present at two distinct places at the same time, or that nothing travels backward in time, or absolute simultaneity, so there's an objective fact of the matter whether two spatially separated events occur at the same time. Uh, or the properties of any given object are fully determinate, or at least certain properties of objects are fully determinate. For instance, there's a determinate fact of the matter about the precise position and momentum of any given particle. So we have this kind of network of claims. Claims about causality, space, time... Um, you know, which are kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're interconnected, they're systematic, they give us a, a sort of, you know, picture, a world view. And the claim is, like, look, these are necessary. The world must be this way. Um, now, in one way or another, all of these claims have been challenged by contemporary physics. <coughs> I mean, of course, it may be that contemporary physical theories will be overturned in the future, but with respect to metaphysical necessity, it looks like the damage is already done. So, um, you know, it's often taken to be the case that general relativity challenges absolute simultaneity. Um, I mean, certainly most physicists will now adopt a picture of the world on which absolute simultaneity is false. Um, so it's, there actually is just no objective fact of the matter whether two spatially separated events occur at the same time in, in some cases. Um, I mean, and general relativity is a serious candidate for a true description of the world. Even if it turns out not, in fact, to have been true, it seems as if the world at least could have been this way, right? So it's going to be metaphysically possible. It's, even if it turns out that somehow there actu actually is absolute simultaneity, it looks like, no, it is metaphysically possible that there not have been absolute simultaneity. Um, you know, our, our assumptions about metaphysical possibility are guided by what's taken seriously in the sciences. Um, so, you know, today, right, the idea that every event has a cause, well, that's been challenged by certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. 
you know, the idea that space is Euclidean, challenged by general relativity. Um, objects being present in two distinct places at once, uh, you know, again, quantum mechanics, we find that um, with the idea of sort of objects having determinate properties, like determinate fact about the position and momentum of any given particle, again, challenged by quantum mechanics. So when we look at, you know, when we look at quantum mechanics, we have this extremely sort of detailed picture of the world, which, you know, it, it seems to be intelligible. We, we, you know, we can understand it. We can understand the picture that it's presenting of the world and it kind of, it sort of makes sense, right? And so even if quantum mechanics is overturned in the future, well, it looks like this describes a way the world could have been. It looks like this describes, again, you know, if you imagine a sort of God, right? This is like God could have brought it about that the world is this way. So there's all these historical candidates for metaphysical necessities which have been overturned. Today, the candidates for metaphysical necessities form a rather odd hodgepodge. So when philosophers discuss metaphysical necessity, they'll tend to give these these sorts of examples. They'll tend to say things like, well, nothing can simultaneously be red and green all over, or nothing is taller than itself, or there are no square circles, or water is H2O, or humans are concrete objects. So, you know, Captain Beefheart, for instance, could have become a chemist, but he couldn't have been the number three. Um, also, uh, analytic truths, so like, you know, all bachelors are unmarried, mathematical truths like two plus two equals four, identity statements like Captain Beefheart is Don Van Vliet, these are often taken to be metaphysically necessary. Now, I mean, first of all, we should notice that this is a rather arbitrary collection of claims. Uh, I mean, we might worry that even if there are necessary truths, uh, they're not, it's not obvious that they're of much theoretical significance, right? Um, but all of these examples, more importantly, all of these examples are controversial. So, um, you know, when it comes to things like analytic truths, well, following Quine, many philosophers deny that there are any analytic truths. <laughs> it's not just that the yeah, it's not just that they're not necessary, right? There, there are none. Uh, uh, so I, I have a video on Quine's critique of the analytic synthetic distinction. I'll link that in the comments. Um, so if we take some of, let's take some of these more uh, specific examples, though. So the proposition that nothing can, can simultaneously be red and green all over. Nothing is simultaneously two colours at once. Again, this is often cited as a, a metaphysical necessity. Could not have been the case that, that something is red and green all over. Why not? Well, I mean, presumably it's true that nothing is, in fact, red and green all over. But why isn't it enough to just say that, you know, that's just true in the actual world, right? Like, how do we make the move to the claim that it's true in all worlds that nothing is red and green all over? How, how do we claim that it's, like, impossible for there to be an object that's red and green all over? Um... I mean, as a matter of fact, we never see any object that is simultaneously two colours at once. So, you know, we observe countless objects and countless colours, and we are never exposed to an object. Uh, we, we, you know, we're never exposed to a scenario where there's an object that simultaneously has two colours. Or even where there's, like, an illusion of an object having two colours. You know, we're not even ex ever exposed to the, to the illusory appearance of an object simultaneously having two colours. Actually, I should note that claim is a little bit controversial. There has been uh, some empirical evidence that in if you sort of create just the right sort of experimental setup, you can create a situation where something appears to be uh, two colours at once. Um, so that's some experimental work by, I think the names were Crane and Piantanada. But if you just look up impossible colours, you'll be able to find that. Anyway... Let's assume, though, let's just grant for the sake of argument, right? We're never, in fact, exposed to an object that is two colours at once. We're never exposed to even the illusion of an object having two colours at once. Maybe we're not even able to mentally visualise an object that has two colours at once. Um, again, personally, I'm just reporting my own mental imagery here. I feel like I don't have any trouble at all, you know, creating a square, say, that is red and green simultaneously. I, in my mind, you know, in my mind's eye, I think that's actually quite an easy thing to do. Um, but, you know, I'll just grant that I'm misreporting my own mental imagery there. And again, people just don't even have the ability to mentally visualize that. So look, what all of this tells us 
is that there are no objects that are two colours simultaneously. Okay, fine. So how do we move from that claim to the claim that there could not possibly be an object that is two colours simultaneously? I mean, you know, when we think about like, okay, so we, we look at objects in the world and we find that they only have one colour. Well, that seems like a straightforward empirical discovery, analogous to the discovery that there are no unicorns or that, you know, all humans are mortal. Uh, we observe many objects, none of which are double coloured. Uh, but what rules it out? Absolutely. I mean, we can explain much of colour perception in terms of the functioning of the human visual system. You know, the way that rods and cones in the retina interact with light reflected from objects, things like that. But we know that the specific arrangement of rods and cones is not metaphysically necessary. Um, moreover, presumably, the laws of physics are not metaphysically necessary. If they had been different, then perhaps the way that light itself interacts with other objects could have been different. Um, given a different visual system, uh, given different laws of physics, perhaps certain objects would appear to be both red and green at once. Um, so, I mean, as uh, Robert Nozick puts it uh, in, his, in his book, Invariances, he says, when we see what a phenomenon reduces to, and thereby see what explains it, if what does the explaining is not itself necessary, then there will be no necessity left. So the point is, is that, you know, what explains, like, we can explain why nothing appears to be both red and green by appealing to certain features of the human visual system. But those features of the visual system, you know, things like the way that the rods and cones work, those features of the visual system don't seem to be metaphysically necessary. So if the reason why nothing appears red and green is... Uh, is to do with, if what explains that is these features of the visual system that are not themselves metaphysically necessary, then presumably um, the fact that nothing appears red and green simultaneously, that's also not metaphysically necessary. By showing how colour experience is dependent on contingent features of the human visual system, we remove its apparent necessity. Let's take the proposition that there are no square circles. Well, here's an example from John Norton in his article, How to Make Possibility Safe for Empiricists. So a square is a figure bounded by four straight lines, symmetric under rotation by a right angle about its centre. Now, take the spherical geometry of the surface of a sphere. So as you can see in this diagram, um, we have a line through the points labelled A, B, C, D, and then... This this line uh, has a centre at point labelled O. Well, on that spherical geometry, we now, it seems, have a square circle. Um, because we have a figure bounded by four straight lines that's symmetric under rotation by a right angle about its centre. Um, and that figure is a circle. So it looks like we have a square circle. And note that uh, if three-dimensional space, like our actual physical space, has a spherical geometry, which is permitted by some currently accepted cosmological theories, then, well, it would turn out that square circles are not merely possible, but actual, right? There would actually be square circles in physical space, uh, at least on this way of thinking about what a square circle is. Now, of course, you know, you might say, well, look, this just uses a sort of technical definition of square. Uh, Norton himself says that if square is defined to be a figure with four pointed corners, then square circles would be uh, logically impossible. They would be ruled out by definition. Um, but actually, even this, I think, might be a bit too strong. So um, consider taxicab geometry. So in taxicab geometry, you sort of you start with a grid structure, right? And suppose that in this space, we can only move between the lines of the grid. So if we take two points at opposite corners of the grid, we don't measure the distance from one point to the other, you know, as the crow flies, right? You don't measure distance in the way that's shown by the green line here. Distance will be measured in terms of the grid path. So the shortest taxicab distance between these two points is 12 units, right? Because like one one unit will be sort of one move along the grid path. Um, and that's shown by 
the red line, the blue line, and the yellow line, right? In, in taxi cab geometry, the red line, the blue line, and the yellow line, they're all the same distance, they're all the same length, right? These lines are all the same length, they're all the same, uh, and so these are all the shortest distance. Um, there's, there's multiple shortest distances between those two points. The red line, blue line, and yellow line um, are all the same taxi cab distance uh, between those two points. So a circle is a set of points that are at a constant distance from a centre, right? Just think of drawing a circle with a compass. You fix your pencil at a specific distance from the spike of the compass, put the spike into a piece of paper, and then just move the pencil around, right? You create a circle by drawing a line, each point of which is an equal distance from the centre point. In taxicab geometry, a circle looks like that. It looks like a square, and it is a square, right? It has pointed corners. Uh, but it, this shows uh, a set of points that are all four units from the centre. Um, so there you go. You've got another square circle. And, you know, taxicab geometry. I mean, look, if our world had been a world with taxicab geometry, then there would have been square circles. Uh, so square circles are possible. Now, of course, I mean, I, I, I have no doubt there will be resistance to these examples. Uh, I suspect a lot of people will say that what's going on here is, you know, ah, oh, well, these aren't really examples of square circles. You're just altering the definition of square and circle. So you might say, look, by definition, a square has pointed corners. A circle does not have pointed corners. So, of course, there cannot be square circles. It's a logical contradiction. Well, under that definition, uh, yes, it would indeed be a logical contradiction. Um, but there are alternative logics that tolerate contradictions, and some philosophers have argued that there are true contradictions. So even this outright contradiction might be possible. But before we get to that, here's a quick advert. Uh, so if you like my videos, you can um, sign up to my Patreon. I have bonus videos available there. So more of me available for a fee. Um, and that, you know, that really helps uh, this channel. I mean, any, um, it, I mean, at the end of the day, this channel is a lot of work and, um, well, anything you can throw my way. Uh, I don't have a high income, so anything you can throw my way, it really helps. Uh, or if you just want to give a one-off donation on PayPal, again, anything, anything helps. Also, I offer private tutoring in philosophy. I have a degree, a master's, a PhD in philosophy, so that's my background. Uh, and there's a Discord that you can join. The links to all of this will be in the description. If you're not interested in, in any of that, um, give the video a like, leave a comment, right? Uh, just any engagement at all, um, every little helps, okay? So uh, I, would, I would really appreciate any of that. Okay then, let's get back to possibilism. Okay, so now we come to an important class of supposed necessities, the logical and mathematical truths. Uh, the propositions established in logic and mathematics appear to be especially secure. So take the law of non-contradiction. So it is not the case that P and not P. Um, how could that possibly turn out to be false? Or modus ponens. So from P and if P then Q, we can infer Q, right? P and if P then Q entails Q. Again, that, like, you know, how could that be false? Uh, you know, similarly mathematical claims, like 2 plus 3 equals 5. Change the world any way you like, and all of these would still be true. We can't even conceive of circumstances in which such propositions fail to hold, and they're not open to falsification in the way that, you know, empirical claims are. Um, Moreover, unlike the philosopher's examples of necessary truths, the truths of logic and mathematics are not a hodgepodge. They're systematically related and they're of great theoretical and practical importance. So, you know, what, what will the possibilists say about this? Well, we have to bear in mind that in logic and mathematics we have seen the development of a, of a variety of different formal systems. So, take logic. Well, in classical logic, a contradiction entails anything. Uh, this is a result of the principle of explosion. From a contradiction, anything follows. Uh, I have a video on explosion that I will link in the comments. So we have the following. 
from P, so P and not P, entails Q for any Q, right? If you affirm a contradiction, anything follows. Does this tell us that contradictions are impossible? Well, there are also paraconsistent logics in which explosion is invalid. Um, in paraconsistent logics, a contradiction does not entail anything. So, you know, we have these two different formal systems, which, you know, they, they're clearly rivals, right? They tell us, they tell us different things, uh, and, and each of them can be taken as, uh, as, as a kind of model, they, they, as a model of what follows from what, as a model of the consequence relation, right? As a, as a model of what follows from what. Um, so which of these logics is correct? Which logic gives us the correct description of what follows from what? Um, so, you know, on the one hand we have, okay, in classical logic we have it that from P and not P it follows that Q for any Q. In paraconsistent logic, from P and not P, it does not follow that Q for any arbitrary Q. Um, so these say different things about what follows from what, and we can ask, okay, which of these is correct? Um, well, there's a great deal of debate about this. Uh, there are some philosophers, such as Graham Priest, who endorse dialetheism, the view that there are true contradictions. These philosophers have described in great detail their view of how the world is, and they have developed pretty sophisticated formal systems of paraconsistent logic which model inference on their view. Now, even if we grant that, in fact, there are no true contradictions, um, and even if we grant that, in fact, classical logic is the one true logic, why shouldn't these alternatives be possible? Right? So wh why would it be impossible that the consequence relation, so why would it be impossible that what follows from what be the way that paraconsistent logic describes? Um, so I mean, keep in mind, right, the point here is not that the law of non-contradiction is false. Uh, some philosophers have argued that it's false, but that's not the point, right? Grant that it's true. The question is, why, what, like, what, what makes it so that it must necessarily be true, right? What do we, you know, add to our account of, of logic by supposing that it involves the discovery of necessary truths? Um, I mean, obviously, the logical truths are going to delineate, delineate the, the domain of logical possibility, right? So given that the law of non-contradiction is, is a logical truth, it is indeed logically impossible for there to be any true contradictions. But the possibilist will say that logical possibility is not possibility in the broadest sense. So similarly, it's not physically possible to accelerate beyond the speed of light. Acceleration beyond the speed of light breaks the actual laws of physics. Had the laws of physics been different, acceleration beyond the speed of light, you know, could have happened. And the laws of physics could have been different. There are worlds with different laws of physics. What are these worlds like? Well, we only need to consider the many alternative physical theories that have been proposed. That gives, you know, those alternative physical theories will give us some description of what these alternative worlds are like. Similarly then, yeah, it's not logically possible for a proposition to be both true and false, Contradiction breaks the actual laws of logic, but had the laws of logic been different, there could have been true contradictions, and the laws of logic could have been different. There are worlds with different laws of logic. What are these worlds like? Well, we only need to consider the, you know, alternative logical systems. The, we only need to consider the sort of theoretical descriptions provided by dialetheists like Graham Priest. Um, so, uh, you, you know, it's... It's, it's, so, so the possibilist doesn't necessarily deny, <clears throat> doesn't deny that there are logical necessities. What the possibilist denies is that the logical necessities are absolutely necessary. Um, and so again, you know, what is gained by taking logical necessities to be absolutely necessary? Well, here's one idea. So we might say, well, look, um, logical validity is defined in terms of truth preservation. Okay, so... The idea is that an argument is logically valid just in case the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Um, an argument is logically valid just in case it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. If we claim that these alternative logics are possible, then this guarantee is lost. In fact, for any argument at all, as the possibilist sees it, 
<coughs> it will be possible in the broadest sense of the term that the premises be true and the conclusion false. Um, so there's just going to be no valid arguments. So there just won't be any logical validity. There won't be any logical laws given the way that we've defined what a logical law is. Um, of course, I suppose the possibilist might just say here, well, look, we, we just need to be careful about how precisely we define logical validity. We just need to qualify our definition of logical validity. Um, so we might say instead that you know, an argument is logically valid just in case the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, um, you know, given the actual logical laws. Or, <coughs> you know, an argument is valid just in case the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion within a certain domain of worlds, or something like that. Um, indeed, in, in a way, I suppose we already restrict the scope of the guarantee, because... You know, we're not going to say that an argument is logically valid just in case the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, even in impossible situations or anything like that. Of course, I suppose that wouldn't really matter because, uh, you know, we usually think that there aren't any impossible situations. But still, um, you, you know, the, the point is, is that um, a, a, as the possibility sees it, we're still going to be able to capture something like the traditional idea of logical validity. Uh, we just have to be careful how we define it. In fact, we can still think of you know, validity in terms of truth preservation. Um, it's just not going to be truth preservation in all situations where, you know, we're thinking of like all situations in terms of absolute possibility. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I mean, what, what the possibilists will say it, with, with respect to logic and mathematics is, well, look, we actually already have uh, a whole bunch of alternative uh, you know, rival formal systems on the table, right? We have classical logic and paraconsistent logic. Um, we have a whole bunch of others as well, right? We have intuitionistic logic. We have fuzzy logic. Um, we have a whole bunch of systems that would just be sort of completely useless practically, um, but still, you know, they give us these very different models of what follows from what. Um, similarly, in, in mathematics, right, uh, we have... Um, corresponding to paraconsistent logics. Similarly, we have inconsistent arithmetics. We have inconsistent geometries. Um, Chris Mortensen has a book on inconsistent geometry, actually. Uh, so anyway, the point is, right, we have these alternatives on the table already. Uh, so um, yeah, the, the, there are no logical or mathematical necessities either. Now, one objection to this idea of alternative logics is the meaning variance thesis. So here's what W.V.O. Quine had to say about people who held that there might be true contradictions. This is Quine <coughs> on dialetheism. He says, They think they are talking about negation. Not. But surely the notion ceased to be recognisable as negation when they took to regarding some conjunctions of the form P and not P as true, and stopped regarding such sentences as implying all others. Here, evidently, is the deviant logician's predicament. When he tries to deny the doctrine, he only changes the subject. So, suppose we come to believe that there are true contradictions, and we thereby adopt a paraconsistent logic. Uh, so we, we, you know, we deny the law of non-contradiction, we say that some propositions of the form P and not P are, or could be, true. In that case, uh, according to Quine, We've just changed the meaning of the words and and not. Uh, change of logic amounts to a change in the meaning of one's terms. I mean, we kind of saw this worry already when we were talking about the case of square circles. So it's like, yeah, you can give examples of, you know, square circles in some technical sense of the terms square and circle. But you can't give any examples of square circles in the ordinary sense of these terms. So... You know, if our counterexample to some purported necessity involves just changing the meanings of the terms, it's no counterexample at all. The law of non-contradiction is a necessary truth, under the old meanings. Our new principles do not really involve denying the law of non-contradiction in this sense. So, our acceptance of the possibility of what we call true contradictions does not really threaten the necessity of the law of non-contradiction. The dispute between the classical logician and the paraconsistent logician is a mere verbal dispute. It's rather like 
one person affirming that God exists, where by God they just mean this kind of, I don't know, entirety of the universe, you know, this sort of pantheist sense, whereas another person, um, you know, denies that God exists, whereby God they mean an omnipotent, omniscient creator of the universe. There's no genuine disagreement there. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the, the idea, the meaning variance thesis. There's a couple of worries about this argument. First worry is this. Merely stating that the law of non-contradiction is part of the meaning of negation, that doesn't actually do anything to solve the problems that might lead somebody to question the law of non-contradiction. So, for instance, um, many dialetheists uh, are motivated to accept dialetheism on the basis of semantic paradoxes such as the liar. So the, the sentence, this sentence is not true. Um, you know, I've, I've got videos where I discuss the liar paradox in more detail. Um, I'll link those in the comments. But anyway, this appears to be a contradiction, right? If we take this sentence, because I mean, like, what, I mean, is it true or false, right? When I say this sentence is not true, well, is that true or false? Well, if we take that sentence to be true, then the sentence is as it says it is. So because it says it's not true, then it must not be true. <laughs> So, OK, we can't assign truth to it. On the other hand, if we say that the sentence is not true, well, in that case, the sentence is not as it says it is. But then given that it says that it's not true and given, th you know, that it, it, then it must it, it must be true. Right. So either way, right, whatever we assign to this, it's going to turn out to be both true and false. Uh, so it's a contradiction. And all we need in order to construct this contradiction is self-reference plus the truth predicate. In any language that allows for self-referential -refer sentences and that also has a truth predicate, we're going to be able to construct a liar sentence. Um, now, of course, you know, there's plenty of debate about this example, but you see how that works, right? Um, there are lots of ways that people have tried to avoid this contradiction. Um, but suffice it to say that there's no easy way out of this. Uh, now, grant that the term, that our term not, right, grant that that term is defined in such a way as to rule out contradiction. Well, that doesn't do anything to solve this problem. It doesn't, it, it, it actually doesn't do anything to tell us, you know, what's wrong with a liar sentence, what, like, or why there couldn't be a liar sentence. It does nothing to show that the liar sentence is not a genuine contradiction some further argument is required here, because it could well just be the case that our language is incoherent, right? I mean, so maybe there are certain terms in our language that rule out contradiction, um, but then there are other features of our language that allow contradictions to be constructed. So maybe it's the case that, yeah, the term not, uh, like the meaning of that term um, is such that it, you know, embodies the law of non-contradiction. Um, okay, but then it may also be the case that there are some other features of our language that allow us to construct contradictions. So um, it could just be that language is, is, is incoherent in that sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not clear that this idea of meaning variance is necessarily going to help much. Nozick uh, makes the point uh, along similar lines that um, if we suppose that the law of non-contradiction, for instance, is a necessary truth, well, how, like, how would it be that the change of meaning is motivated in the first place? I mean, the necessary truths are supposed to hold in all circumstances. They're true of everything that there is. So, like, w like OK, what motivates the shift from the old meaning to the new one? Um, so like, if we grant that the most powerful language for representing the world might be such that the negation operator is... You know, so, so it might be such that like, the way that words are defined in that language allows us to affirm the sentence P and not P. Um, OK, the meanings are different, right? But this language, you know, it solves problems. It can be used to organize experience, can be used to make empirical predictions and so on. And there's, you know, there might well be these well-motivated inferences that favor adopting this language over the old language. Maybe reflection on semantic paradoxes like the liar paradox leads us to favor this new language. Now, the claim is that since this language just changes the meaning of negation, the law of non-contradiction remains a necessary truth under the old meanings. But then, like, what led to the adoption of the new meanings? Um, you know, I mean, it looks like what the situation is. We have these old concepts that faced some problem, right? They, like the semantic paradoxes. And then as a response to that problem, we shifted to these new concepts. 
and it kind of looks like that means that the old concepts didn't get things right. <laughs> um, <coughs> but then it's a little bit odd to say that, well, you know, the law of non-contradiction, for instance, that like those old concepts embodied a necessary truth. Here's a second worry about the meaning variance argument. Any theoretical change might be represented as a change in meaning. Uh, here's an example from Paul Churchman's book, Scientific Realism and the Plasticity of Mind. So consider phlogiston theory in chemistry. This is a superseded theory of combustion, uh, com the idea that combustion involves the release of this substance called phlogiston. Um, there are certain basic claims about phlogiston that embody just what it is for something to be phlogiston. For instance, phlogiston is an er elemental substance, phlogiston forms compounds with other substances, combustion consists in the release of phlogiston. These claims basically just define what phlogiston is. So to deny these claims is not really consistent with our understanding of the meanings of the terms involved. Um, like the meaning of phlogiston, right, is just that phlogiston is an elemental substance and that combustion consists in the release of phlogiston. So, <coughs> you know, that's just, you know, if you, if you deny them, right, if you say that actually, uh, it's, it, no, uh, combustion doesn't consist in the release of phlogiston, you just don't understand what the word phlogiston means, right? So you can kind of imagine a um, debate between a chemist who accepts phlogiston theory and one who denies it. And the, the, the phlogiston chemist grants that there are well-motivated reasons to adopt the alternative theory. But in doing so, she says, we're just changing the meanings of our terms, right? Because if you deny that phlogiston is an elemental substance, or if you deny that combustion involves the release of phlogiston, you're just using the word phlogiston in a different way to her. Um, so, I mean, I don't think anyone would take this argument all that seriously. And I, I certainly don't think anyone would be tempted to say that phlogiston theory is a necessary truth. Um, you know, I don't think this is a good argument for the necessity of phlogiston theory. So the question is, what would be the difference between this case and the debate over alternative logics? So I want to end this with a more general point. Um, it's worth keeping in mind that, in principle, nothing can pre prevent us from stipulating that we're going to use words a certain way. So I can decide that anything labelled square cannot also be labelled circle, uh, in which case, of course, I will say that there cannot be square circles. Similarly, I can just decide that I'm going to use the word not in such a way that, you know, for any P, I will never affirm P and not P. Um, that's just a decision. That's a linguistic convention. And in principle, I could stick to that convention, come what may. Now, if this is all that necessity amounts to, if necessity merely records a decision to use words a certain way, it seems to be drained of its metaphysical significance, right? For any labels X and Y, there can be people who will simply refuse, come what may, to apply X and Y to the same object. If that's how they choose to speak, so be it. But of course, we can speak in whatever ways we like. We can stipulate whatever we like. There are no unicorns, but presumably there might have been unicorns. But what if I simply refuse, come what may, to apply the term horse and the term horn to one and the same object? And what if I just say, well, yeah, I mean, whenever I call, whenever I say that something has a horn, well, that's it. It's just not a horse anymore. Um, I'm just going to take it as a linguistic convention that horses never have horns. Does that make unicorns a metaphysical impossibility? Um, does, you know, so metaphysical necessity, metaphysical impossibility, are these just like records of how we've decided to use words? Uh, like records of our you know, dogmatism about word usage. I mean, <clears throat> if that's all metaphysical um, necessity or metaphysical impossibility actually amounts to, um, it, it does seem to be drained of at least the metaphysical significance. Um, okay, so anyway, that's uh, the meaning variance objection. A somewhat different objection to the possibilist is the relativization objection. This may have occurred to you. So let's suppose that it turns out that there are indeed possible alternative logics. So it turns out that the law of non-contradiction is not a necessary truth. It's possible for there to be contradictions in the, bro in the broadest sense of possible. 
Well, we might think that we can still state a, an absolutely necessary truth by relativizing the proposition in the following way. Given the axioms of classical logic, it is not the case that P and not P. So even if it's possible that there be true contradictions, well, surely it's not possible given, you know, given classical logic that there are true contradictions. And this is going to be a general strategy that we can apply to save necessities, right? Uh, <coughs> even if it's possible that modus ponens be invalid, well, surely it's not possible that given classical logic, modus ponens is, is invalid. Um, similarly, yeah, we can define geometries in which there are square circles. Well, there are still no square circles in Euclidean geometry. Given Euclidean geometry, there are no square circles. So perhaps Euclidean geometry could have been false as a description of space-time, but the fact that Euclidean geometry precludes square circles, that fact could not have been different. Um, I mean, similarly, given general relativity, nothing accelerates beyond the speed of light. General relativity could have been different, but the fact that general relativity precludes acceleration beyond the speed of light, that could not have been different. Um, so the necessary truths are going to have the form given P, then Q. But notice that with this, we are talking about consequence relations. We are talking about what follows from what. It follows from the axioms of Euclidean geometry that there are no square circles. This claim about what follows from what holds in all possible situations. But what follows from what? That's a matter of the logical laws. So if we say that it's possible that the logical laws could have been different, then we're saying it's possible that what follows from what could have been different. For instance, I mean, like, okay, so like, why, why does Euclidean geometry rule out square circles? Well, I mean, one answer to this is that it would be a contradiction to affirm both Euclidean geometry while also affirming that there's a figure with four straight sides where this figure also consists only of points that are equidistant from a fixed centre. <coughs> That's just contradictory. But as we've seen, a possibilist will argue that contradictions are possible. If the logical laws had been different, there might have been contradictions. And if there had been contradictions, it might have been that square circles could obtain even in Euclidean geometry. So, <coughs> the... Um, Possibilists will say that by establishing the possibility of alternative logic, she thereby undermines the relativization strategy. So I noted that possibilism is an unpopular position. Why are we so tempted to treat certain truths as necessary truths? Well, Robert Nozick proposes a kind of evolutionary debunking argument regarding our intuitions about necessity. So one of the things that we have been endowed with by Evolution is a, is a faculty for thinking up possibilities. We can imagine alternative states of affairs and reason about what would occur were certain alternatives to obtain. Imagination like this is often taken as a guide to possibility. Um, so see my video, uh, Conceivability and Possibility, for more on this. If, for some truth P, we are unable to conceive of a scenario in which P is false, we are tempted to say that P is a necessary truth, that P could not have been false. Now, our ancestors evolved in the actual world, so there was no selective pressure towards reliability about all possible worlds. There may have been pressure towards accuracy with respect to some possibilities, because by reasoning through counterfactual situations, we can improve our behaviour in the future. I mean, when attempting to hunt an animal, I may run through various different actions and I try to work out, you know, what, what would happen were I to perform such actions. And that might be an important part of improving the hunting process. In thinking through these alternative actions, I am thinking through various possibilities. A mechanism that generates reliable beliefs about the actual world, reliable beliefs about what will actually happen, may therefore be expected to generate reliable beliefs about some close possible worlds as well. But there's no reason to expect that it will be reliable with respect to all possibilities, like worlds with radically different laws of nature, or worlds where what follows from what is different. It may be that we are only able to imagine possibilities of certain restricted kinds. In particular, there may actually be selection against the capacity to imagine distant possibilities. First of all, because there are many situations in which we need to make very quick decisions, in those situations, it may be counterproductive to waste time on possibilities that are unlikely to be realised. Second, because there are various falsehoods that we need to avoid believing. 
you know, any animal's mind needs to be very strict about the way that it represents the world. So there are certain basic principles of inference that are going to be very forcefully maintained. Anything that violates such principles uh, would have the appearance of impossibility, right? It's like they would have the appearance that like this just can't happen. It's just off the table of consideration for a serious belief. So like, you know, when it comes to, you know, because of the way the world, uh, the environment works, um, if you think about certain very basic arithmetic, like, you know, one plus one equals two. OK, well, you see one tiger go into a cave, you see a second tiger go into a cave. You need to know that there's going to be two tigers in the cave, right? Uh, if you see one tiger go into a cave, another tiger go into the cave, and then you see one tiger leave the cave, you need to know there's still a tiger in the cave. So, I mean, you know, even if, right, like some alternative arithmetic is possible, Right. It's just not a good idea for that to be something that, you know, we can even conceive of. Um, so, yeah, I mean, take something like Euclidean geometry, right? For the, for the practical purposes in our ancestral environment, Euclidean geometry is true enough. Representing space as Euclidean and, and making inferences in accordance with this would have served our ancestors perfectly well, maybe better than any alternative. I mean, non-Euclidean geometry, even if it's a correct representation of actual space, might have just been too complex or whatever. Since Euclidean representation worked well in all practical situations, there may have been selective pressure towards giving this the appearance of self-evidence. Indeed, maybe it just became sort of built into how human minds represent space. So any alternative geometry will seem impossible to us. But that's just an artifact of, you know, our selective history. So the general argument is basically like this. Right. So our belief that P is a necessary truth is explained by our evolutionary history. But with respect to necessity, evolution is an off track process. Evolution is not going to track the truth about what is uh, possible and what is necessary. So uh, at least, you know, in the broadest sense. So our belief that P is a necessary truth is unjustified. Evolutionary processes will tend to give us beliefs. Um, more generally, it will tend to give us ways of representing the world that promote survival and reproduction. It may have promoted survival and reproduction to take certain truths as self-evident, to take them as necessary. If those truths have held true for long enough and in a broad enough range of contexts. So given that Euclidean geometry is approximately true for our ordinary environment, given that it's always been that way, given that it's such a useful way of representing space and all of this, we should expect that we would be inclined to judge it to be necessarily true, regardless of whether or not it really is necessarily true. Right? We should expect that it would have this appearance of self-evidence, that it would have this appearance where, you know, any like the alternative is just impossible or inconceivable. So, you know, this, that's just going to be generally the case, right, for... But for any sort of approximate truth that's very useful, that's applicable in a broad range of circumstances, there's going to be selective pressure towards judging it to be a necessary truth, regardless of whether it is in fact a necessary truth. So our intuitions about necessity are not justified. They're not trustworthy. Um, and so when we kind of have this feeling that certain things must be the case, that they could not have been otherwise, we shouldn't trust that. Or so Nozick says. Um... And that's that. I'm going to leave that there. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye.